God, it's a big one. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Okay. Here, real fast. Fast. Okay, good. Don't forget to let him go when he takes off, okay? Yeah. I don't feel anything. Why do you go like this? Oh, no. No? I still got it. Still got it. Let him go? Yeah. So when he pulls, you don't have to stop. He stops pulling. Then you realign it. Mix the bowl, baby. Mix the bowl, not wrist. Not wrist? Not the wrist. You're mixing the bowl when you're real, okay? Oh. You have to watch me. You have to watch me. Watch me. Mix the bowl. You don't miss. Mix the bowl. Okay? Mix the bowl. Mix the bowl. Mix the bowl. There it is. It's going to take off again. Okay? Take your time. <laughs> Rod took up in the air and stop. Okay. Keep, keep real. Pull up to that. Let's do that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Woo! Whoa! <laughs> Biggest fish ever. <laughs> Bit of a panic station in there, eh? <laughs> I'm right across from Squamish, British Columbia. Actually, basically this is like fresh water and ocean right here. And I will, I'm gonna show you a quick 360 with this camera, all right? So that's looking straight towards the Squamish, is the city, the town, whatever you wanna call it. It's right behind that, those trees. There's the camera with my McDonald's napkins on top of it. <laughs> Unloading a container ship or loading it with something right there, probably tum lumber, who knows. Squamish River. And uh, freshwater estuary, chum salmon in there. And um, seals are hammering on the, the fish in there right now. <coughs> and here we are. Here we are. Hurley's a pretty cool. Uh, Waterfall right there. And there you go. There you go. That's where I am. It has been raining so hard, it's absolutely ridiculous. Like, holy shit, when's it gonna stop? I got a couple hours to kill. I'm not hanging out inside to kill it, so uh, got an appointment at 1.45 or something. So I'm going to read a couple more emails. Just like I said, every time I throw a video here to you guys, the inboxes just blow up. I get dozens and dozens of emails back. Dozens. It's just not, it's, it's never going to end. So many people out there experiencing all this shit. So many of us were all being lied to so fiercely. It's ridiculous. That is so easily proven how we are so being lied to. But whatever. You know what, it doesn't matter. We don't need the answers. You don't, you don't need anybody of authority in your life. You just don't. You need to figure shit out yourself, learn yourself, and you pick up the knowledge from your community, from your family and friends. That's how life works, man. However, it happened that we transitioned absolute word and power to a handful of strangers that call themselves politicians or whoever is beyond me. That's an absolute joke. So here we are. That's probably why there's over 160 some odd thousand people on this channel today and increasing by the day is because more and more people are realizing that we're all we have is each other and we are the ones with the knowledge. <laughs> That's who has the knowledge, it's us. And we're sharing it, right? So let's see what other knowledge we got shared with us today via some emails. <clears throat> Taking it from the top, here we go. Looks like a fairly long one maybe. Hope it's written properly. Steve, I've hesitated to send this. I know you get tons of emails, but heck, I'm typing this out for me too. So it's okay if you never read it. I work in a career surrounded by death and carnage. I've always found that writing things down, even if for no one else to see, was a bit of a de-stress debrief for me. 
Let me start by saying that finding a video's last hunting season was refreshing. I've been dealing with some experiences for years, and these knuckleheads in a couple Facebook groups I joined are clueless. Can you imagine wishing to have these experiences? What total ignorance and naive stupidity to wish to be a statistic. People have, by and large, romanticized these damn creatures just like they have with wolves, seeking them out, gifting food. They're out of their effing minds. That said, I appreciate what you're doing. I think it's important. Keep it up. I'm always looking for new, your new stories and am at least a little reassured by the ones who say it isn't stop them, hasn't stopped them from enjoying the outdoors. In the interest of trying to keep this short, I've rewritten re and condensed it several times and tried my best to keep the grammar smooth. It's still really long, and for that I apologize. I will skip the details of my past and just leave it at this. I'm a lifelong hunter, fisherman, hiker. I was definitely a free-range child with no boundaries and spent a lot of time in the swamps as a child by myself doing things I would never let my kids go off and do. I should also say that I'm particularly in tune with that sixth sense. I've always have been since childhood. I sometimes don't listen to it well enough, it seems. I've had three experiences with these abominations. Only one of those involved seeing one. I'll try to explain the events. I live on the Gulf Coast, and for my first two encounters took place in the swamps here. I was somewhere around 19 when my sister and I decided to go squirrel hunting on land I grew up hunting. It was a mix of swamp and hardwoods, and is on the edge of thousands of acres of undisturbed swamp. In fact, you just read an email from another fellow that had experiences there. The Marapau, Marapau Swamp. Back to the story. We went to the woods on a day that was finally void of rain. We went through the swamp and up into the oaks to squirrel hunt, even though I knew it would be shitty because of the gusting wind. As expected, we didn't see a single damn squirrel, so no shots were fired to alert anything of our presence. We regrouped and walked out of the pine line clearing that runs through the property. My sister just wanted to shoot, so I was looking for a target for her before it came too dark. Suddenly, a six foot or better tall man stepped out of the tree line down the clearing approximately 75 to 100 yards away. He was dark from head to toe and thickly built. It was near impossible to make out much detail as the tree line it walked out of had the sun behind it casting a shadow over him. He took two long strides, walked carelessly when he turned and looked in our direction. We had many poachers, so my immediate thought was, poacher or not, I'm sure glad we didn't actually shoot this idiot out here wearing no safety orange. Wait, he wasn't carrying a rifle, that's odd. So at the moment he saw us, and in a very unhumane-like movement, he leapt back to the tree line it had just walked out of and landed in a squatted position where I suppose he figured he wouldn't be see we wouldn't see him. I'll be honest, he did blend into the brush and palms quite well, but the backlighting made him very noticeable. As all this happened in a fraction of time and behind my sister, she did not see this. For some reason, I felt no desire to tell her about it. I raised a low power scoped 22 long rifle to try and get a closer look as it squatted there. I could clearly make it out and the hairy edges of his profile, but no detail. I couldn't help but think to myself that he is, has to see me pointing my rifle at him. Why wouldn't he stand away with his arms in the interest of self preservation? I decided to take a shot into the center of the clearing about 50 yards to his left. I hope he'd either identify himself or flee. Nope. It remained fidgeting around and swaying a bit while crouched. So I put a round in the leaves of the tree far above him. Still, didn't make any attempt at self-preservation. Shit, now I'm concerned. I tell my sister it's time for us to go and promise to bring her shooting another time as the darkness is creeping in fast and we have some nasty snake-filled swamp to wade through. I never did tell her what I saw. I continued to keep the close eye on this dude and he, as we started to move across the clearing, it moved on all fours deeper in the tree line and disappeared. I never did tell her what I saw. I continued to keep a close eye on this dude, and as we started to move across the clearing, it moved, on all fours, deeper into the tree line and disappeared. The creature followed us all the way out. It stayed just on the side of the other side of the bayou, a mighty creek to you Yankees. <laughs> it was fairly quiet, but at this point the breeze had died down and the palms were too thick to be utterly silent. I felt terrified on that walk out. The sun was down, but my hackles were straight up knowing I was being watched, and knowing that whatever or whoever it was in no way intimidated by me or a rifle. We were being tracked. We were now the prey. I didn't want to think about what, was, what it was, but something about the way it moved, it wasn't human, and it took me a while to admit to myself it was one of those Sasquatches like the Patterson film, but not as thickly built. It was unsettling. Had those been around for the past tens of, year, 
10 years of me playing out there. I'd never seen tracks. Well, after I dismissed the event and really never thought about it again until recently, on to the next experience. Fast forward several years, my early 30s. I'd been busy with work and hadn't hunted for several years. I decided to go make a hog hunt to blow off steam and scratch the itch. I left around 3 a.m. for a large swampy wildlife management area about one and a half hours away. The Achafalia Basin. Achafalia Basin. The Achafalia Basin. It had been some time since I hunted there. It was during the week and deer season was over, so I didn't see a single person or a vehicle on the, MW, on the WMA that day. As I arrived, I take a wrong turn somewhere along the old abandoned oil railroads and ended up down a narrow muddy road. I was getting concerned about getting stuck in the mud and having no idea where to call help to in the dark. Finally, the road opened up around a defunct oil well and then continued on from there. It was wide enough for me to make a U-turn, but my brand of caution had me decide to put the windows down, park the truck, get out to inspect the area for fear of snaking my truck. With the windows down, I sat there for a moment because a feeling of apprehension swept over me. I blew that off as concern for my current predicament. As soon as my dome light comes on, because of opening the door, as I start to step out of my truck, I heard the most horrific, guttural, blood-curdling, loud, long scream from the tree lines in the pasture side of my truck. My windows were down, and it came straight through my truck and cut through me to the core. It was like three voices in one. Part of it was deep and guttural, while the other two danced around at a higher shrieking pitch. Hell, maybe it was the three voices. I don't know. I know that everything out there sounds like, so I thought. It was no screech owl. It was no panther. It was no bobcat. Needless to say, my foot never hit the ground, and in a moment of rash decision making, I slammed that truck into drive and cut a rooster tailing donut like you've never seen. It almost got stuck. I was waving serious regrets and feeling sick as my truck began to lose speed in the turn of the bank. God, it found tra- Thank God it found traction again, and I made it back up the road, and I got the F out of there. I don't know what it was or what to think, but I knew it was terrifying and I was shaking. I decided I wasn't getting out of my truck until shooting light and then and left well before dark. Third experience. Fast forward again to this past year, and I'll be honest, this is the one that really has me on edge because it involved my son and has put a different perspective on it for me. At six foot four and a solid 250 pounds, I used to think I was invincible. I might still feel, I might still feel that way, but raising children changes a man and the possibility of putting your child in harm's way is a, is a heavy burden. I really hadn't given the Bigfoot thing any thought despite those the previous encounters. This next story is the reason I went looking for answers and I found your channel. My eight-year-old son and I made a trip to Northwest LA, so Louisiana, into a massive management area to a tent camp to hunt for four days. We arrived to a very empty camping area as the initial rush of early season hunters had passed and it was during the week. We made a tent camp and set up to scout around some spots a friend suggested. It was later in the day when we got into the woods. As we walked in off the road, I was immediately hit with a really pungent equine-like urine smell, which I found odd, but didn't think too much of. I thought maybe someone had set off an old funky buck bomb that had gone bad and shrugged it off. Walking into the woods, being as quiet as one can with an eight-year-old in tow, I started hearing an animal moving just inside the thicket about 40 yards to our left that ran along both sides of a creek there. As we crouched and listened to it moving, I noted the wind was favorable for us and coming from the direction of the movement. I was completely focused on this area to the point I hadn't heed my son trying to quietly get my attention to tell me there was a deer walking in front and right at us. Ha <laughs> ha. Won't that I won't make that make mistake again. The movement stopped and I assumed whatever it was had dropped down into or across the creek, so we continued on. Suddenly this incredibly loud knocking sound started. It was three to four knocks at a time with a pause between them. This happened three times. My son and I looked at each other puzzled. He asked if, I, if it was a woodpecker. I told him if it is, it's the size of a pterodactyl. We found a nice place where a few fell trees made a natural ground blind. After sitting a few minutes, suddenly the woods came to life. It was bizarre. That is when I realized how deathly quiet the woods had been prior to that. After about 20 minutes, that incredibly loud knock happened again and the woods fell utterly quiet again. This time, it was only one set of knocks, and it was still quite close to us. After a while, 
I heard the animal move away from the creek and the ruckus of it spooking up a couple wood ducks in the creek. The woods became back to life after a few minutes, but we never saw any game while waiting until dark. There were deer tracks and scrapes all over, so I hoped we'd have better luck in the morning. I left ribbons on the branches on the way out to mark a trail back into the dark. Next morning, we returned to the dark, a good hour before shooting light. That morning, the smell was way heavier and more putrid. On the way in, I held on to my son because I felt so uneasy. I felt like I was being watched to the point I kept looking up in the trees for another hunter. There's no rational reason for these feelings. I'm not afraid of the dark, and I'm comfortable in the dark woods. I'm an experienced outdoorsman, and I've never been afraid of anything under swamps or hardwoods. I felt really apprehensive, and the scenario started playing through my head of whether I was armed well enough with my son's deer rifle and my 40 cal sidearm. I don't have a lot of experience with large land predators unless you count the two-legged kinds of society. I've never before felt that vulnerable, but in no way associated with the events of the day before. I was turning over in my head how to best protect my son if we ran into whatever it was that was giving me that feeling. I would stop now and then listen and look, nothing. I had a headlamp on and I would look ahead to the next ribbon and follow our trail. I got so disoriented that somehow I ended up back at the road we walked in from. Any other day, I could have moved through this dark straight to the spot with no trail markers or lights. We stood at the road for a bit and I'll tell you, I thought about leaving. My sixth sense is telling me to leave. We're trying to get my son's first deer and I guess I wanted that for him too much to listen to my gut. So I shrugged it off and went back into the woods like an idiot. We got to our spot while it was still quite dark and settled in. My son quickly fell asleep. Come light, the woods came to life. As usual, and all was normal for about 20 or 30 minutes. I was feeling pretty good about our chances. Suddenly the knocks happened again. The deafening silence returned, not a bird, not a squirrel, nothing moved. The sound came from around the creek again. Only one set of knocks followed by silence for about five minutes. Then the branches started cracking and trees breaking, and a whole stand of large trees started swaying despite no wind. Now that's intimidating, a whole stand of large trees swaying. I've kind of semi-experienced something similar to that. This is only about 50 or 60 yards away, but heavily, but with heavy, heavily undergrown. I was froze and my son, thank God, slept through it. That went on for maybe two or three minutes, but it felt like an eternity while I tried in vain to see who was making the ruckus. In retrospect, it would have been one hell of an opportunity to ambush us from behind in an organized attack. At the very least, it could have been a distraction for something that got stuck in a lit area following us to make its way out of sight. It's getting wet. We stayed until about 11 a.m. I was afraid of exposing myself as I felt my position was relatively defensible. I still didn't understand what had transpired. I sat there perplexed, hand on edge. We were in a clearer area and returning meant going back to the thickets. I was afraid of being ambushed. When my son got cold, that was all the extra excuse I needed to make the decision to get out. We made a beeline out. We didn't return to that spot and may never again. Nothing else interesting happened over the next couple days other than our tent being visited by a pack of coyotes in the early morning. That's kind of odd. None of it made any sense to me. We had to different areas the rest of the trip with no incidents. The following night, while raxing around a fire, my son asked, Dad, is Bigfoot real? I didn't know how to answer that because I didn't want him to fear the woods, but I also wanted to keep him safe. I couldn't help but find the question as odd, though, so I questioned about why he asked me, and he didn't let on to having seen or heard anything. I dismissed it during the trip, but it kept eating away at my mind until I started putting the pieces together and remembering those previous events. Once it all clicked, it hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm not sure what I'm going to do this hunting season. My son's talked about hunting, but the thought of endangering my son bothers me so much. I'm having a tough time bringing myself to want to go back into the woods. I just don't know how to deal with it. I never thought I would dread the woods. I loved hunting and fishing, and I want that for my children, but it's difficult for me to find the desire to go now. All my life, I said I would retire on acreage in the middle of nowhere and shoot deer off my porch wearing only, only my underwear. That no longer appeals to me. The only way I've been able to reconcile this whole thing is to think that maybe it was that creature's way of saying, I'm here, I'm powerful, and next time you hear those knocks, it means you need to leave my territory. I just wish I could look forward to the outdoors again. I'm going to plan on hunting this fall because I feel if I don't, that'll become a permanent inhibition for me. But dang, I'm on edge with it all. 
Why us? Why three different locations so far separated? Why do my peers think I'm crazy if I bring it up? Does it get easier? Does the enjoyment return? Sincerely, Jay. All right, and he left me a note for myself, and I'll read that after, man. Thanks for your email, and you know by now, you've seen all the shit on my channel, you know you're not alone. And, uh, and you also know that 100% of the people that have written in haven't disappeared. <coughs> Excuse me. But you also know that 100% of the people that have wrote in haven't disappeared, right? They haven't had an arm tore off or their head chewed off. I guess the people that may that possibly have had that happen wouldn't write in anyway, though, right? But anyway, um, I think it's fairly obvious you can tell by all my videos. And if you follow that, my Instagram is where most of my, it's predominantly outdoor content. You can see that I am out in the woods all the time, no matter what. And I've had a handful of experiences with these things. I've had the living shit scared out of me. I've been absolutely intimidated before, and I just left. So you're right, just leave. I'm warning you, you are being warned. You're being told they're making a statement. So um, I, don't, I don't think we've had one person write in. They laughed at the warning and went running towards it yet, have we? I don't recall if anybody's done that yet. But uh, you have to go with your gut instincts. And as far as exposing your son to the outdoors and making sure that he enjoys the outdoors, you got to do it. You have to do it. And unfortunately, you have to be honest with him. You have to be honest with him and you got to fill him in with the honest knowledge. That's where the change comes in for all of us. That's where acceptance comes in. That's where the knowledge goes mainstream is being honest and filling in the children, the next generation. We have to. It's no joking around about this shit anymore. It's not a joke. This is not a joke. It's 100% real. There's no way it's going away. And laughing and stuffing your head in that hole in the sand is not going to change shit. You might find six or eight friends with the like, like-minded like thoughts of belittling people, and that might work for you with one or two people at a time. But it's not going to work much longer. For, that's a note for the people out there that are belittling and laughing. And uh, furthermore, who gives a shit? Who gives a shit what anybody thinks? Who cares? Somebody doesn't want anything to do with this topic. Who cares? See ya. Don't talk to him about it. I don't. Somebody uh, wants to inquire and know about this topic? Yeah, I'll share it with them. You know, it's funny. I went and saw a friend of mine's wife at their business the other day, dropped some stuff off, and, uh, and she'd been following my channel. Right away, she just started laughing, laughing her head off out loud, like honestly thought it was humorous, and saying, holy cow, your channel's going crazy. Isn't it crazy when all the crazies come out, you know? And I'm not saying anything belittling or demeaning to her, but that's your typical reaction. Until I looked her square in the eye, didn't laugh, and I said, well, uh, just so you know, I know the people who are responsible for obtaining over 110 DNA samples, and uh, so these things are quite real. And then her, her entire expression changed, saw that I was absolutely sincere and dead serious, and then I filled her in with as much as I could, and walked away after 10 minutes with Another person who previously laughed at it, 10 minutes later, like, holy shit, no way. I'm like, yeah, way. But anyway, so, you know, it's been proven. It doesn't matter. It, it, there's so much dog shit and horrible shit going on this planet, misinformation. If you think you're going to take on the task of getting the entire planet population to accept that these things are real, you're wasting your time. You're absolutely wasting your time. It doesn't matter. The majority of the people that don't can't accept or deal with this topic, they don't matter. They just don't. They will matter when they have their own experience and they'll come over to the other side and, and want to have some they'll wanna they'll wanna get some honest knowledge and their time will come. But until until then, I wouldn't worry just don't worry about anybody. Worry about yourselves. Worry about yourselves. If you've had an experience, honestly share it with your children, all right? Share it with them so they have the tools to deal with it if it happens to them later in life. You know? Um, a lot of people that keep people sheltered from this topic, you probably shouldn't, all right? You probably should in educate them on the sounds and the experiences and the feelings that go on in these places. And then at the same time, you can give them a heads up on how to deal with it. And, and at least they'll have some tools on how to deal with it if or when it happens to them. And that is the correct thing to do, all right? Um, <clears throat> being laughed at these days from other human beings, who gives a shit? I've said it before, I said it, I'll say it again. The second you stop worrying about what other humans believe, 
that is the beginning of you becoming very, very successful and very content in life. That is the key number one move. You stop worrying about what other people think. Stop it. <laughs> Just quit it. All right? And, uh, and carry on. But anyway, um, there's some noise around here, man. I'm going to go back down the road and see. I've got to see what time it is. Clock's in the truck, and we'll... Uh, I know, it's right in my pocket. What do I got here? I got enough time to blast off another email or two. Well, we, uh, we'll go farther up the road here and see what kind of a backdrop we can get in and catch some wildlife in the video maybe while we do it.